the Guardians still are currently not playing. They'll have a game Friday against the White Sox. Last day of draft, for those who are getting tired of that. We're also going to talk about some trade ideas uh, and what I think is likely to happen at this year's trade deadline on today's Locked On Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians. Your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. I want to thank you for making Locked On Guardians your first listen today, free today and every day, wherever you get podcasts. And inter- introduce myself, as you're always supposed to reset and do. I am Jeff Ellis, the host of Locked On Guardians, as I have been for nearly 800 episodes now. Uh, I, before that, I was a primarily a draft analyst, but also a prospect analyst at Scout and 24/7. And then before that, you might have uh, read me on just about every Cleveland sports blog uh, back in the day as a draft specialist, uh, because Cleveland loves drafts, let's be honest. Speaking of drafts, I sat down and watched all the press conferences about the draft, and I took some handwritten notes, as I like to do, and I thought I'd just go through some of these, because I think it provides some interesting information directly from the front office. So I thought I would lead off with that. We got five more players to cover from day three, giving them their in-depth look, and then... We're going to talk some trades, because everyone locked, loves to talk trades. I thought it was interesting with Magnus Ellert's upside was the first word uh, mentioned by Scott Barnsby, the scouting director. Uh, with Jack Jasek, it was uh, spinning breaking ball was what stood out. Press Kavanaugh, uh, plus runner, uh, track record of success. And then you're going to notice like what I'm saying here, plus runner, tr- uh the you know track record of success, bat to ball skills, uh, and ability to play multiple positions that came up with like eighty percent of the bats that they drafted. Every single outfielder they believe can handle all three spots in the outfield and is a plus athlete. Going down Taft, interesting. The only guy that got uh, or Lo- not Logan Taft. I wrote Taft. <laughs> That's where he went to school. Uh, man, uh, he went to Taft High School. Logan, uh, I'm having a Clark. <laughs> Logan Clark. Plus makeup, the only, re- I can't recall anyone else getting plus makeup. Work ethic, also the only one who got it. Offensive upside. So there you go. Again, I think he's the one that people from this class might end up really liking. Like he's going to be the uh, the sleeper candidate for a lot of people from this class. Uh, Zer- Zerate, control the zone, feel to hit, can move around. Very similar for these outfitters. Shakeups is an injury. He thought it was a shoulder. That was not confirmed. But he is healthy now. I wonder if we'll see him pitch this year because he only threw eight innings this past year. Uh, only mentioned two pitches with him. Rivera, up to 97, sits 92 to 94, misses bats uh, with his breaking ball. He's currently able to use his breaking ball to miss bats. Wrap, low three-quarter slot, fastball slider, late action on the slider. Uh, he was highly effective in college. And then in terms of day two... So again, all from the scouting director. This is why I took Lamp, uh, Lampy, athletic, elite performance, can play all three spots. Furman, advanced field to hit, fun to watch, plus runner. Talked about playing in the outfield. They can also play the outfield, but it made it seem like maybe he's an outfielder in the future. Uh, Guy Lipscomb Jr., football player in high school. You see that type of athleticism. Developing plower, plower, power can play all three spots. DeLuca, plus slider was mentioned so fastball they did not call anyone else's uh off-speed pitch plus this is the only one i believe in the whole press conference that got that plus label and they really seem to dig him and as we talked about before another low slot guy uh santos elite arm what's interesting here is spinning a breaking ball almost nothing i read anywhere talked about a slider but they talked about the breaking ball and i believe they said slider it's about the only place you see that but up to i think they said up to 98 which is higher than it had been listed anywhere as well for that. Uh, Jordan Humphreys, durable, which again, for a high school kid, I don't know. They must see something in the build. Plus fastball. They think it's going to become a plus fastball. We didn't hear a lot of, they were very stingy in using the idea of plus, which is, you know, one grade above normal. Like an average pitch is a, I'm going to get this wrong, you know, we think a 50 and then a 60 would be plus. So a step up. Uh, Peterson, makeup, slider, 
uh, stands out. Zibin, the youngest player in the draft, physical, 97, can throw a changeup already. And then the day one guys, uh, Campbell mentioned the changeup again, and Masek mentioned the changeup uh, up to 97 for Campbell. And then uh, Delotter being 100% healthy. So those were kind of their notes on those players. Like I said, I sat there and I watched, I listened to all the press conferences. I should have taken part. Like I felt nervous about taking part. And then I watched them and it was like two mainstream media. And then a lot of people that I know from, and again, it's not to like, not crap, like Willie and Justin are fantastic, but uh, it's nothing against them. There's no, but there, they're just fantastic. End of story. You should follow them. If you're not already, there's some of the best out there in general. But I don't know. I still got that block where I'm like, oh, no, this is going to be like all those people. And I'm going to be like out of place when I pop into the Zoom with my little name there. And then I see it's the people I know. And I'm like, oh, OK, it's not scary. It's people, you know. So I, I sat down and watched all of those. The question I would have honestly asked uh, if I had been in, if you're curious, is, uh, you know, you are known as an organization that targets you know, younger age players, you follow a model that, that seems to prefer younger age players. So what does it say about players like Clark and Santos who go against type? Like, is that just your scouts really win? Is it just you like them so much? Or does that tell us like a, a degree of, you know, how good these players stood out in spite of that age uh, issue, like in terms of modeling? So it would have been fun to hear that question. Uh, next time I will do it. I promise. We're going to take our first break early here. Come back, talk about those, you know, last five players. Some of them we talked about here from the organization, but I've also pulled up stats data and we'll just be realistic and talk about what I think the outcomes are more than likely for said players. All of that on today's Lockdown Guardians after a quick commercial break. Today's sponsor is LinkedIn. Yes. And if you need a job, you may not always, you think about LinkedIn for the ability to have connections, social media, but it's the best place for a small business to find jobs. You can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates who are right for your job. That's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? I'm not a job seeker, but I can tell you I was there this week myself. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockdownmlb. That's linkedin.com slash lockdownmlb to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Okay, so now we got, uh, you know, the last, I guess actually the last four, because we did talk about Logan Clark uh, in depth yesterday. Uh, Because I pulled that all up. So let's get into these last four players. And then, like I said, we're going to talk some trade ideas after this. So if you are drafted out, I am not, (laughs) not by far. Uh, You know, we we will discuss in very small, like more passing information as players sign and money gets distributed. But uh, I will say the other takeaway very quickly before getting these ones. It seemed like Barnsby, uh, they're going to sign everyone. You know, the discussion was like, you know, how many of these guys are going to sign? The goal is to sign everyone. And then I was talking online with Willie and Justin. And right now, the Guardians minor league roster sits at 171. Uh, so they can add nine more players to their, their minor leagues. Uh, and then at the end of the year, and but so for instance, if you sign Justin Campbell and he's pitched a ton of innings, so he doesn't pitch this year, he doesn't count against that until the day after the World Series. So this is also thanks to Arthur Kenny, Kenny who uh, clarified. So at the end of the World Series, it goes from 180 to 190. But all draft picks will count. So if you add in 21 draft picks right now, you would get 192. So you're kind of looking at it like, okay, they're going to have to make a release or two. Uh, They also asked about um, undrafted free agents, and they didn't seem to be – I think they'll add some. They typically always do, but they did not seem very – you know, there was no like, yeah, we're going to get at – like it seemed like we'll look at it, we're going to evaluate and see what's there and how it can help our team. So it was not a, a feeling of, like, let's turn around and immediately get at it. Uh, they did change the rules this year. So if you're an undrafted free agent, you can get up to 125000 So the same as, like, a, a 19th round pick. So it can, it's more expensive. This isn't, like, the cheapness it was the past few years for teams. Uh, they also clarified the draft and follow, which for those who aren't familiar, this was a thing that used to be there but is not. 
So if, for instance, like uh, Gio Rivera is going to Oregon, but let's say he's not. Let's say he was staying at Walters Community College. You would take one hundred twenty-five thousand plus a hundred thousand more. So you'd have to save a hundred thousand in terms of your cap, right, of your pool, uh, and you could then wait till next year's draft to sign him. So you kind of work out this deal that, yeah, we're going to hold on to your rights. But they said, like, let's say that they enroll in a JUCO in the fall, but then in the spring they go to a major college program, you lose it. So it's a gamble still. So, But still, I thought that was interesting uh, to get that degree of clarification. As I was not sure on that. But let's get in these players. Angel Zarte, you know, the two, you know, half of these picks were uh, UNC guys. Uh, we talked about it. He played all four spots. He was the first guy, I saw the thing, in a very long time to have 100 hits for them. <laughs> what's the story in this draft, right? Like contact skills, uh, versatility, speed. That's him. I don't know if he's ever going to be a starter. I don't know, you know, if he's more than like a backup type. But then again, honestly, that's what I would have said about Stephen Kwan. Now he's the difference between Stephen Kwan and him is Kwan was, um, you know, a day two pick. He was a significant, this is not to say that's not a significant pick, but when you're in the teens versus when you're in day two, it, it is a big difference. The other thing that really stood out is when you look at Zarte, you look at almost every single batter in this class, there are two-way guys. They were very heavy on players who got to campus as two-way players. I, I would argue, I mean, it's the top of my head, but I bet that at least 70% of this draft class were significant two-way prospects uh, out of high school. That seemed to have been something that they were big on, that it, that is a, a shifting point that points to potentially more ceiling once you focus, but that's something that stands out. Uh, let's see, Zarte turned bef- the day before the draft, 23. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's an old senior. Like, most, we look at most seniors at 22. So, I, you know, I, I think I, I wouldn't be shocked if he doesn't even get the full slot due to age. Uh, he's a good player to have in your system because of his versatility. They were heavy on versatility with a lot of guys. It's clear that that is kind of the, the big trait here. Moving on to... Uh, 18th round pick uh, Zach Jacobs. He's the one who was hurt only through eight innings this past year. Uh, last year, he was in the Cape in 2021. Uh, eight strikeouts per nine, 2.84 walks per nine, five six eight ERA. So not the best. He was a starter and a reliever. Uh, not the best performance. His hit per nine was over 10. He was very hittable. I think they'll probably let him try as a starter. Uh, his hit per nine as a sophomore in the Big West was almost 12. Like, he, he is very hittable. So uh, he did miss bats, which is, again, it's it's eight innings because he was so limited. So he missed bats this year. He's never missed bats in college. His, his strikeout per nine in college was 6.63. I'm assuming they see things they can fix. He's six foot one. He's not the biggest guy. He's got the nice secondary pitch. Maybe you put him in the bullpen and it plays up. Maybe there's some easy things they see they can fix. Uh, they have... You know, gone to Riverside before. It is a college they feel comfortable with. You know, just recently in terms of, you know, Riverside. Let's see if it's going to pull up for me here. Uh, I was trying to remember. Well, that's, I hate how it's not in order. I felt like they had someone really recent in here, but maybe I'm wrong uh, with that. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's a solid program. It's had a few players in there. They've gotten the big leagues. But I, I look at this as... It's clearly something they see because the overall statistical performance, it doesn't really make him stand out. Uh, I think, you know, the the fact that his blog, the little blog, no, he's a little blurb uh, on the official thing, talks about his high school success, kind of says something. And it's, again, not to, to denigrate the kid, but he's 20 years old. He'll be, uh, he's very young. It, it's not like he's a draft-eligible sophomore. He's a young junior. Like, he's September 9th is his birthday. So he's a very young junior. I think you're hoping that there's just more development. And I think they see things that can develop in him. You know, they've had a few of those day three guys have big jumps. Uh, You know, Denholm from UC Irvine was kind of a similar build. So I I don't want to make it seem like I'm just saying he's not good or anything like that. I think they're seeing uh, an ascending talent. And he just didn't pitch this year. And he's super young for the class level. And he showed him enough between the Cape. I mean, he threw more in the Cape, which is unusual, than he did his junior year. So statistically, he doesn't go with their models. So I think this is just pure. One of the scouts sees something, and there's something they feel like they can do. Uh, interesting player in the slider, I think, stands out. And we know they like sliders, and that's part of the reason you know, he goes there. 
19th rounder, Gio Rivera Jr., probably the hardest guy to sign on day three. I hadn't realized before 6'3", 260 is his listed weight. Uh, up to 97, can show some secondary offerings, Oregon commute. He's He's got a live arm. Like he is a live arm guy. He was, I think he went to Old Dominion last year, and a lot of players left that program at the end of last year I was seeing. Uh, went to the community college, pitched very well. I think they said his strikeouts per nine at that level were over 14. Like he just he decimated the JUCO level. Uh, it, it's a good JUCO program he went to as well. It, it's you're just he, he's a big, thick kid, and you're he can already bring it. And he's built like a you know an innings eating starter, and you're hoping the secondary pitches will catch up. But he's a, you know for I didn't even look to see. I mean he's probably in the system. I don't know why I didn't pull his up. I don't know his exact age because again he went to Old Dominion a year ago, so it's not like he is your typical. Uh, when you see a kid like this, you often think, okay, so they went to one year of college, and then they um, they're getting drafted. No, he's got two years of college, so he's. Um, he's not old, but he's not young either. But again, his, he's got some of the best stuff of just pure stuff of any player that they drafted. So yeah, I'm just scrolling too far down. Like I said, I don't know why I had everyone else's pulled up in front of me. Uh, no, cause he started in 2020 at old dominion as a reliever those two years. Um, so 2020, so this is, he's a third year. So he's a junior, uh, right now. 62250 listed here. 63 uh, 62260 is what it lists on the MLB side of things. Yeah, he's he's junior aged. Uh, utterly dominated his level. The problem is at Old Dominion, he got eight innings his first two years. He's been on the radar since high school. He's a known guy. There's perfect game data you can go find. But I at his age, because that's the thing. If he goes to Oregon, he performs super well. Then he's senior aged, and I don't know how much. I mean, he could get more. But, yeah, I think uh, there's a very good chance they sign him. When they first got him, I was thinking it was like he was two years younger than he was. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter, older or younger. It's still one of the most live arms they drafted. And I wouldn't be shocked if it's a little bit over slot, but I'm not thinking massively under slot uh, for him there. And then Sean Rapp is interesting, honestly. You might be like a 20th round pick is interesting. One of the final, uh, this, you know, their final pick. Cold weather arm, New Jersey kid, goes to UNC and just gets used a lot. He, he wasn't the closer. He only had two saves over his three years there. But, I mean, he had 40 appearances this year, I believe. Uh, 45 innings. He was like uh, their Brian Shaw. He's a lefty. The slider plays up. The slider can get out righties or lefties. But it's I think they said like deadly versus lefties. He, he might be a loogie, but... I mean, this team has been looking for consistent left-handed relief pitching for a while, and there's a chance he's that. Like, you look at the profile, you look at what he has, what he throws, the low release angle, it's going to be hard for him to get out righties. I think while he's done it in school, uh, he may not be able to do it as well in the pros, but it's fine. There's still value in a guy who's death versus lefties. Like, the loogie role has not completely gone away, even with rule changes. Uh, his brother is in the twin system, so there's bloodlines. I just think he's interesting because I think he's... Uh, you know, a potential, I believe he could potentially get to the major leagues as a left-handed reliever. Hard to pick up. Good slider. We know they love the slider. Uh, speaking of things we know they love and fans love, we're going to talk trades. But first, we're going to take a break now that we've finished giving everyone their due, talking about the players in an interesting 21-pick class for the Cleveland Guardians. Again, I don't think anyone cracks the top 10. The latter's close, but I only think maybe two of these guys actually would cr- crack the top 20 for the guardians that's how deep the system is this year we'll talk about them more as we get official signings but uh yeah no it's uh i don't know if everyone saw but uh it ended up that uh baltimore did not take a, a haircut with matt holiday he signed for slightly more than drew jones so they just liked him they they liked him and i think positional value at the end of the day stands at the forefront something i talked about in many a podcast here again we're going to take that break come back and talk about you know, trade targets I get asked about, and then let's talk about the trade targets that we should really be discussing on today's Lockdown Guardians. Listen, right now, my uh, my phone, I feel like it's been blowing up with, like, second-half odds and, uh, you know, bets and all of that information uh, just through all the sports apps I follow. Like, this is part of the game now. It's part of what people talk about. And if you want to be informed, if you want to know, if you want to have the upper hand, you want to go to betonline.net, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your betting needs. 
Find your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and golf. BetOnline continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports wagering information from live in-game betting, scores, and podcasts they have you covered. Head to BetOnline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today. BetOnline, where the game starts. Okay, so obviously everyone's talking about Soto. And then, uh, you know, I kind of was curious to go look in general at Washington. That's a bad team. <laughs> like, that is a team, they, sh- they should trade him. Because they're, they're not close to anything. Like, that is a roster that is devo- devoid, not devoid, <laughs> devoid of talent. Uh, in terms of war, they only have three players in- offensively with wars above one right now. Kiebert Ruiz, who's, uh, you know, better than what Cleveland has a catcher offensively. And defensively, he's, he's solid. Like, he's, I wouldn't be opposed to adding Kiebert Ruiz. Let's put it that way. Josh Bell, who I believe is going to be a free agent, who's performing very well. And then Juan Soto. After that, it gets ugly. And pitching wise, like I read a thing about Kyle Finnegan and his trade value, and I'm like, I don't know. You look at the advanced stats. I don't see why you would give up a ton for him. Let's see. Bell is a yeah, he's a free agent at the end of this year, so he's a rental. Uh, it's I mean, it's it's ugly, and it's a bad minor leagues from you know years of signing free agents and things like that. Where yeah, it's getting better because uh, it can't get worse. And after that World Series win, they've been awful so there's you know high picks help them out but at the same time it's like uh Cade Cavalli Cole Henry Brady House were the fan graphs top guys uh, Jackson Rutledge was a first round pick from a few years ago um he's down there there's a lot of guys just it's ugly they ne- they need to make some deals they need to figure some things out but uh, I don't think there's anything that makes a ton of sense <laughs> with the Guardians having said that so instead you know, the, the other guy that comes up, and I've brought him up many times, so it's my own darn fault when people ask me. Listen, Anthony Santander is fascinating. Switch hitter, you got to love that. His offensive ratings and everything outside of chase rate are, like, light to, to darkish red. Hard hit percentage is 50th. His worst expected batting average is 45th. But, I mean, he is offensively fantastic. Everything's there. He does chase a little bit. Uh, he's very slow, and he's awful defensively. Like, he's when Fran Mill is at his best, he's a very similar player. He's very similar to Fran Mill. Uh, so it's it's hard to consider a trade for him because, yeah, when you're running strong, Quan, those two cover a lot of ground, but he, he's just not there. I mean, it, Santander should be a DH on a good team. Like, that's just the truth of the matter. So instead, let's look at guys who might fit. And I went and looked at uh, swinging strike percentages and, you know, who have the two lowest swinging strike percentages in baseball. Stephen Kwan and Miles Straw. Uh, Jose was up there before the injury and kind of the time coming back from that. We know this is something that stands out, something that, that is important. So I was going through that list, and a few names popped. So let's talk about them. Let's talk about the two big names, and then we're going to end with the guy who I think makes sense, uh, maybe makes the most sense. So let's start with another common uh, podcast discussion, which is Ian Happ. So Ian Happ is a player I've been talking about trying to trade for for about a year, just pulling up his savant data because I have it for everyone else, but not him. Uh, you know, he's an all-star. He's got two years left, and he's been, you know, fantastic. Of all the players, he has been the best player this year. Uh, and that's the thing, though. For all of his struggles, like, every single season he has been in the big leagues, he's had a runs created plus over 100. Like, he has been, it's a 114 for his career. So we talked about the struggles. It's still been there. Uh, he's improved defensively this year. It's still not great, but he's also not going to kill you out there. You know, it's a 42 for outs above average. Uh, he's another switch hitter. And, you know, the offensive stuff doesn't look as good on Savant as um, as Santander's. But defensively, at least he can be average-ish. Uh, he also doesn't have the chase rate issue. He's more of a consistent guy there. And his sprint speed is good. So he also brings some value when he gets on base. I don't know how costly he is right now. And again, it's just a two-year deal, so that kind of limits him. But I think he still stands out. Like, if you want to go out and get the biggest improvement, that is the guy to look at. Uh, now, in terms of team control, a guy you would have for a, a few years, not just, you know, a year and a half, Ramon Lariano has come back and played well. He's got a 115 runs created plus. You get him through, you know, 22, 23, 24, and 25. You're getting him for essentially three and a half years. Uh, you know, it's he's and it's not a big salary because of his suspension. He's another guy. Every single year, runs created plus over 100. 
Uh, it used to have really high defensive grades. It's kind of come back to earth. On the savant side of things, his outs above average isn't great. But I think that's mostly because he's not played well in center this year. He just hasn't. You put him in right field, he's got the arm for it. He's fine. He's a right fielder right now. Less of a center fielder, more of a right fielder. Right-handed bat, which I know people still you know, uh, say we don't have enough of. Can strike out. Batting average is going to be low. But he barrels it. He doesn't chase a lot. Uh, the, the exit velocities are decent. His, you know, his overall performance is solid. I don't think he's necessarily going to have the highs of someone like um, of Hap. And you know, that 24 home run year does look, I mean, it's not really that big of an outlier because you go back to like last year, he was at 14 in 88 games and he's at 9 in 62. So yeah, I think he could be a guy who hits about 240 on base in the 310 to 320 range and then hits 20 plus home runs from the right side while playing, I think, in right field, at least average to above average defense with an absolute cannon that no one's going to run on. I think there's value in that. And I think there's value in three and a half years of control now. If you're like, what about all the young players? I get that. But there is also something to be said for proven, right? For the guy who can do it. Look no further than the Cincinnati Reds, right? Nick Senzel. How many people berated me when I was like, I don't think Senzel is worth that cost, especially after the first year in his struggles. Have you followed through? Like, Senzel was as bad as can't miss as they can come, and I was huge on him. I mean, I had him as the number two player in that draft class. I thought he was a great player, but then once he got up there, I was like, there are some concerning things with this. He hasn't, you know, hasn't come together. And he's he's got less, he's probably got about as much team control as Lariano, but I'd much rather, you know, go for someone like this, where we see what it is. And, you know, I, I think he's a, I've talked about him a lot, not as much as Hap, not as much as Santander. But I think he stands out just because you're getting him for such a long time, and he's you know what you're getting, right? He is not. We can't be sure. I love Nolan Jones to death, but there is definitely a world where he doesn't make enough contact to stick. Like that's just the truth of it. That that can happen. I'm not gonna sit back and tell you, oh, he's like, there's no such thing as can't miss. There isn't. Andrew Benintendi, you know, is was an All Star this year. He was the number one prospect in baseball. Took him how long to finally get to that one All Star year? He was good. He was average good, but that's not what you want in the number one prospect in baseball. So there's always risk. And then the next player, maybe the most likely, and the guy we should probably talk about the most, is someone no one's calling for, and that's Connor Joe. So he is an outfielder slash first baseman for Colorado these last two years. He is already, uh, let's see, I, I believe twenty. Yeah, tw- he's going to be thirty in August. But here's the thing. Okay, so team control. He has almost no service time. So you have him for 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, and 27. Five and a half years of team control. You get him for his entire 30s. You basically get him for the rest of the time that he is productive. Uh, If you're worried about splits, I can tell you about the home and away splits for him this year. Let me go down to the advanced side of things. His home runs created plus is 100. His away runs created plus is a 105. He has been better away from Colorado. He is not a power hitter. Uh, he is he is a right-handed bat. Again, I know that has been a thing that people are worried about. But you look at what he has done. So if we go over to his advanced stats, uh, average exit velocity, 15th percentile. Barrel, 16th percentile. Expected slugging, 20th. You're like, why do we want this guy? Hard hit percentage, 15th, all dark blue. Walk percentage, 93rd. Whiff percentage, 70th. Chase rate, 88. Outs above average, playing in the outfield, 63rd percentile. Uh, 22 percentile for outfielder jump. He's pretty terrible, and he doesn't have good speed at 37, but he's still covering ground well there. He He's a contact guy. He fits what they do, right? This is a player that, if they're going to go out and add someone, so, so far this year... Uh, he has been worth, outs above average, a plus one run at first base, plus two runs in left field, negative two in right, because I don't think he's got much of an arm. But why he fits everything this Guardians team seems to do about, five and a half years control, contact skills, walk rate, versatility. This team needs a more proven right-handed, well, not... Especially, I do think Fran Mill Reyes is on the block. I, I do believe that article by Terry Pluto 100%. I, I buy that because they want flexibility. And this draft, which I started the show with, and I, I intentionally 
started the show that way to talk about how much they talked about even the players they were drafting and flexibility. To the end of the show, we talk about Hap, who's got two years of control left. We talk about, you know, the three and a half with Lariano. Then there's Connor Joe, who you get five years of control, is right-handed, which fits a need, especially if you move on from Fran Mill. You need someone, you know, it, how much do you believe in Oscar Gonzalez is the question. And then you get the versatility of a guy who can play first, can play the outfield spots, is actually not a bad defender in left, and has some of the best um, patience in the game, is going to, again, he's not hitting for any power in Colorado. It's not coming. He's not going to hit home runs in Cleveland, but he's because he is not a power hitter, uh, he is more effective on the road. And you don't worry about a fallout from him not playing particularly well, uh, leaving Colorado, because that's not his game. His game isn't affected by that. So I I would be all for Connor Joe. If you're curious, I went and looked at the trade value simulator. He's actually got a value of 15.2, because if you look at him this year in terms of war, I mean, he's been worth uh, almost one war. Like, he's got about a two-win player. I mean, he hasn't played every day. He's born in 85 games. He's played every day. 12% walk rate, 20% strikeout rate. Runs created plus a 103. It was 116 last year. He is a league average player, but a league average player who can play three spots, work counts, get on base, and be a right-handed bat, there is value in that. There is value. My co-host, my co-host likes Connor Joe as well. You know, he has a lot of Stephen Kwan to his game. And don't I don't mean that in terms of um, ethnicity. Don't don't get into that. I just mean in terms of these guys they get on base, both of them. It's, it's, I would put Miles Straw in that group, but he strikes out a little bit more. Like, the swing and strike isn't as high for him. It's like I said, those are the bottom two. But when you set those guys up, when you have Straw at nine and you were to do something like Quan at one and Joe at two, those three guys are going to see so many pitches it's going to exhaust. It is going to exhaust a starter. So I think he's an interesting player to go out and consider. What would a trade look like? Well, you know, again, if you are the Guardians, you want to trade away from some of those players who are clogging the roster. You want to look at ways that make sense if you are the Guardians to help clear out some of that roster jam. If we were just looking at pure, that's the Rockies, I clicked on the wrong one, Uh, you know, just a straight up value, like who is projected to be a 15 value, Uh, it'd be Naylor, like he has the same valuation as Josh Naylor or Tyler Freeman. Uh, would be a little high. And then, here, let me pause for one second while my air conditioning hopefully shuts up in a moment here. Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to shut off. But here's the thing. Beyond that, they have interesting pen options, too, right, in Colorado. Lucas Gilbreth, fastball slider, a lefty reliever. The walk rate's been a little high, but he's been effective this year, and his FIP is quite good. Could he be, you know, a potential left-handed pitching option for the Guardians? Uh, Alex Colome has been great, but he's a free agent to be. Same with... um, Daniel Bard. What about a former Ohio State and Walsh kid Ryan Feltner? Ryan Feltner is has a huge fastball. At home, his walk. Um, at home, his home run rate is three point five five. On the road, it's a one three two. He is a guy where his FIP at home is eight two five. His FIP on the road is four zero three. That's pretty solid. He's got a lot of team control. Uh, he has almost no service time, and again, a huge fastball. Ohio kid would be interesting to bring back. You could make a deal that makes sense. You could use that infield depth, get Connor Joe, get Ryan Feltner, maybe even try to get, you know, let's not get crazy and say try to get three guys. But if you look at those two players and what they could potentially bring, and again, Colorado is not great at pitcher development, and Ryan Feltner has an elite fastball. So if you're able to work with a guy like that, if he's able to get coached up a little bit better, consider me all on board same thing like again this team could use more left-handed depth if i can get all three i'm willing to trade four prospects that are you know get trade them batonfield like i like batonfield quite a bit but uh the 40 man is a mess like trade you know trade away four guys from the 40 man uh or you know four guys that need to be added soon like batonfield give me those those three give me those two uh, you can keep it away from being the bigger prospect guys. I know I tend to fall back to Jose Tenya because he's already on the roster and they have so many infielders. But of the shortstops, he's the one I'm most willing personally to move on from. But I, I think there is a deal to be had and it is a way to make the Guardians better. What do you think? Uh, is Connor Joe just not interesting enough? 
Had you been familiar with him? Let me know. Hit me up on my Twitter at Jeff MLB draft. Uh, you know, I'm always curious to hear feedback on these ideas. Like I said, he's not the big name, but I think he could do a lot. And again, he fits that Yandy Diaz, that Stephen Kwan, that when he was healthy, the Jose Ramirez, the Miles Straw, the guys we have seen, the approach the Cleveland likes in terms of walks, strikeouts, ball to bat skills. I think he'd be a perfect fit. Let me know. And uh, thank you for rating and reviewing, downloading. It helps. I do want to give, I meant to do the COA at the beginning of the show. We'll do it at the end. I'm traveling next week. So I'm sorry we're going dark for a week. I have not taken a break in a very long time. I hope everyone will be understanding. Go watch old shows, right? <laughs> it's, it's evergreen. You can go find one on the history of a certain draft. And that data is still there. If you've never listened to those, you can go back and find those historical ones. They stay evergreen. And as I end every show, go, go, Guardians, go. <laughs>